um, at, to Atlantis for organizing these webinars. And it's great to see so many friends out there. Um, and, um, you know, whether it's morning, afternoon, evening, middle of the night um, around the globe, it's great to talk to have a chance to talk to so many of you about something that I'm, is near and dear to my heart. And um, that being the Verde Island Passage and, and where it fits into um, what we know about marine biodiversity around the world and how, um, you know, in these days of doom and gloom that it, it really is a beacon of hope of, about how conservation and more sustainable practices are really making a difference and and we are really seeing some positive um, aspects of that. So I want to share some of that good news with you, something that we all need in today's world. Um, sorry. Um, so as I don't have to explain to all of you, coral reefs are really just a treasure trove of, of biodiversity around the world. And um, collectively, coral reefs only make up a quarter of a percent of the ocean's area. But packed into that quarter of a percent is more than 25 percent um, of the known marine biodiversity that um, we're aware of. And, and I say that because we still are discovering so many things. And probably we only know um, about 10% of the species that, that live in the world's ocean. So there are many new things to, to add to our um, foundational knowledge about um, marine biodiversity. But the other thing that we know from looking at the impacts of super typhoons, which are increasing in number, frequency, um, and intensity, that when super typhoon Yolanda struck the Philippines in, in um, 2013, one of the really important lessons from that was that areas that had healthy reefs and healthy mangrove systems sustained much less damage and much less uh, loss, loss of life. And so coral reefs not only provide food, pharmaceuticals, all kinds of things, but they also provide primary protection from storms. And so having healthy reefs, healthy mangroves, and healthy seagrass beds is really critical to people's basic survival. And if we look at the Indian and Pacific Ocean tropics, we know that the greatest diversity of marine life is concentrated in what we call the Coral Triangle, which stretches from the Philippines to include um, parts of Malaysia, most of Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and some people also include the Solomon Islands and Timor-Este in, in the nations that make up the um, Coral Triangle. But one of the questions that we've had um, scientifically is in that Coral Triangle, which is the richest part of the Coral Triangle? And um, I've been diving in, in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and the Philippines and use the same methods. And so if we look at the same number of dives that, um, that I made in, in each one of these places, um, looking for nudibranchs and their relatives, you can see that the species accumulation curve for the Philippines is, <coughs> excuse me, is about twice as steep as, as what we find in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. And this is a real indication that its species richness is much higher than either of these other areas. And we have lots of other evidence to support this idea that the Philippines really is the center of marine biodiversity within the Coral Triangle. And back in 2005, um, two ichthyologists, Kent Carpenter and Vic Springer, um, 
demonstrated that the Verde Island Passage has the richest shore fish fauna in, in of any place in the world. And um, what they found is that if you looked at all of the fish species that were found in the Coral Triangle region, that 58% of those species were found just in the Verde Island Passage alone. And that, that means almost 1,700 different species of fishes. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so we've been uh, able to sample the Verde Island Passage all around that passage. Um, from with a series of expeditions that brought experts in all major fields of marine biodiversity <coughs> to look at the Verde Island Passage and really ascertain where within the Verde Island Passage is the richest part. And also to really examine whether that diversity is um, evenly distributed, whether there are parts of the Verde Island Passage that have unique species that are not found in other parts, and how does that really um, suggest that we need to effectively manage the Verde Island Passage as the richest part of the, the oceans that we're aware of. So as you've, um, those of you who've been to Puerto Galera and to the Anilao region of, um, you know, this wonderful air body of water that separates um, southern Luzon from Mindoro. You've seen just staggering diversity, and, and this is one of the reasons that it is a mecca for um, macro photographers and, um, and, you know, a mecca for marine biologists in general. And so every group that we look at, there's just astounding biodiversity. And we keep finding new species and we find things, we find new species of fishes, barnacles, um, tenophores, worms, soft corals, everything. Basically every group that we've looked at, we keep finding new species. <coughs> and the diversity of starfish is just really remarkable. Um, and you know, it really is a galaxy of different starfish. Um, and the mollusks are unbelievable. Um, we looked at marine algae, we looked at barnacles, we looked at sponges, soft corals, fishes, you name it, everything just is off the charts. And when we've brought world experts on different groups of organisms to the Verde Island Passage, they've just been blown away. And um, they've found staggering new species. And, and we've, in the expeditions that we did between uh, 2014 and 2018, we found more than 500 new species of marine life just in the Verde Island Passage alone. And it's not restricted to the Verde Island Passage. We also had the opportunity to visit um, Atlant hosted by Atlantis in, in um, Dumaguete, and we found many new species there. Um, and some of these are really um, very large, obvious species that, that just have not been documented because the the area has been underexplored. And so we know that other parts of the Philippines also have just amazing diversity and richness that um, remains to be discovered and documented. And um, these are some of the new species of shallow water fishes that we found in the Dumaguete region um, uh, in our 2016 expedition. Oops. And one of the things that we are trying to document is the diversity over time um, in these areas and, and basically to get a sense of um, whether we're finding all of the diversity that's resonant there. And so one of the ways that you do that is by having a total species accumulation curve over time. And um, in this case, um, 
if you are flattening the curve, much as you're doing, trying to flatten a curve in an epidemic, um, if you flatten that curve, then you have really um, found most of the resonant biodiversity. And, and in more than 25 years now of looking at the Verity Island Passage, we are not flattening the curve. We're still finding new species. And um, on average, we are documenting one new species of nudibranch per dive that we make um, in uh, the Verde Island Passage. And this really hasn't changed uh, much over the 25 years that we've been there. You can see there's some times when the curve is a little lower, um, sometimes it's higher, and um, basically there are variables in terms of all of this, but, but basically we continue to find new and exciting things throughout the Verde Island Passage. And just to give you an idea, um, in 1997, we'd found about 475 different species of nudibranchs, and 40% of them were um, not yet named by scientists. And so these were brand new species that um, had been documented, and so we were finding about 40%. When you carry this forward to 2015, um, we've now found more than 1,200 species in the Verde Island Passage, and more than half of those species are unnamed species not yet documented by scientists. And so that's pretty astounding that half of what we're finding are new species. And just to give you an idea, um, these are some of the, the new nudibranchs that we found in um, 2011 when we had a very large expedition um, and we found about 50 new species of nudibranchs. 2014, um, we um, were concentrate, concentrating mostly in the Anilao region and um, found about 42 species. 2015, we were uh, focused in, in um, Puerto Galera area and found all about the same number of, of brand new species that had not yet been documented. So one of the things that we've been doing is, is trying to compare the Verde Island Passage with other parts of the Philippines. And, and most logic would tell you that as you went deeper into the tropics, so into the Visayas region that um, includes Negros and the Dumaguete area, um, you would expect that diversity to be higher, but that's not what the data tell us. And um, basically, um, if you look at Mabini representing the Verde Island Passage and Dumaguete, um, you can see that the species accumulation curve is much steeper um, in the Verde Island Passage region. So this was another independent way of testing whether or not the Verde Island Passage really was the center of the center of marine biodiversity. And that seems to be holding very nicely. And um, even within the Verde Island Passage, we found that um, not all areas of the Verde Island Passage have um, the same diversity or the same species, but that the central part of the Verde the Island Passage, which includes Puerto Galera and Verde Island, um, that Puerto Galera has a lot more diversity, say, than nearby Verde Island. And um, this is because it has greater habitat diversity of, um, you know, extensive bays with lots of fingers going in and out. And um, for those of you who've been to Atlantis and Puerto Galera, you know what kinds of habitats are there, and that habitat diversity um, means that there are many more opportunities for different species to be there. So the other things that we've found is that we've looked at the western end of the Verde Island Passage at, um, and Lubang Island, which is um, situated right in the middle of the Verde Island Passage, and it has much lower diversity um, than the central part of, of the Anilao area in Puerto Galera and Verde Island areas. And then again, to the east of 
um, the central area, the diversity drops off again in places like Lebeau and even farther east. But what we do find is that there are unique species in the western part, there are um, unique species in the eastern part. So you can't just say, well, we're really going to focus on conserving the central part of the Verde Island Passage and we will be able to conserve everything because that's not what happens is you have unique species in different parts of the Verde Island Passage. <clears throat> and while the central part has the greatest diversity overall, um, you really need to have a, a regional comprehensive conservation plan to preserve all of that diversity that's present there. And if we look at different groups of, of nudibranchs as an example, we can see that you know, recently we've discovered lots of new biodiversity that if you go back from the beginning of recording um, and describing species to 1758 to the time of Linnaeus, that there were 26 species in this genus Trepania. Um, and that when we really started looking at this um, with one of my postdoctoral students, um, and I, we found 16 new species um, and named them. And since then, we've found another 16, and 10 of these are just found um, in the Verde Island Passage. So we've more than almost doubled the diversity j just in um, this one um, genus of nudibranchs. And that's fairly typical of what we find in, in um, nudibranch diversity and, and how the Verde Island Passage is really important. The other things that we found is that there are many species that um, at one point, all of these um, things that beautiful Chromodora nudibranchs that I'm showing here were thought to, to be a single species. And um, the more we've studied those, uh, we found that they not only look different, they are different, and each one of those color morphs actually comp constitutes a single species, and there are at least eight species that we know of um, in this group, and that um, many of them, the majority of them are found in the, the Verde Island Passage. There are at least six in the, of the eight in the Verde Island Passage. And one of the things is that was most surprising in this, if we look at this evolutionary tree and we look at this group on the top that are members of this purple group, we found that one species, this one in orange down at the very bottom of the, the tree, um, which not only is a distinct species from the others, it's not even the closest relative of, of these others in this um, species complex. And so we know that these things have evolved similar color patterns independently from different ancestors. Because if you look at the closest relative of, of the purple colored one that's in the bottom group, its closest relative doesn't have that color pattern at all. And so this suggests that these things have evolved independently and that you have um, a a bunch of species mimicry going on of these um, nudibranchs, which are all highly distasteful. And one another thing that we found is that in another group of um, in the same genus Hypsilodorus, that there are lots of species with white lines found throughout the world. And um, if we look at them, there are 14 different species and molecular techniques where we're able to sample their DNA has helped us identify a lot of these really cryptic species. Um, and that advances in technology have really provided new tools for us to estimate biodiversity. And when we look at all of these white line species, you can see that they're found in different places on the evolutionary tree and that that um, white line color pattern has evolved at least five different times independently. And so again, there's this mimicry of similar color patterns. And it's thought that the benefit to um, this is that 
the evolutionary advantage of having a similar color pattern is that predators need to learn fewer color patterns of what is distasteful and what is not. And this is advantageous to the native ranks and to all of the species <clears throat> that have that similar color pattern. Another thing that we really looked at closely was this fascinating group of tiny little um, slugs called the batwing slugs. Um, and most of these are about five millimeters in length. So less than your, um, your baby, your fingernail on your baby finger. Um, and these are tiny little guys and they are called batwing slugs because they can swim through the water column using these parapodia. And we found um, in 2014 and 2015, what we thought were eight different new species that were found um, in different parts of the Verde Island Passage. And we studied their evolutionary tree and we found that in fact, all eight of the species that we were looking at were new species and um, that they were widely distributed on the evolutionary tree for all members of the family. And when we calculated this, much to our surprise, of all the species that are known in the world, 41% of the members of this family were found in the Verde Island Passage. So that just shows you, again, how highly concentrated the diversity of marine life is in, in the Verde Island Passage. Well, one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, we've also been exploring the twilight zone, the mesophotic zone between um, 200 and 500 feet, 60 to 150 meters in depth, which is the least um, well-known part of the ocean. And when we explored the twilight zone, we found some really surprising things. The twilight zone really is a different world. And we found lots of new species of fishes. Um, we have a team of, of um, divers and at, trained at the academy who um, use uh, rebreather technology and, and trimix to, um, to dive to these great depths. And it's you know, incredibly exciting, but it's also incredibly rigorous in terms of the technology, the safety, um, measures that need to be taken. And most importantly, I think, is that you have to, uh, for about 15 minutes of bottom time, you spend five to six hours um, coming back up to the surface. So it requires a major commitment in terms of uh, time and a drain on your body is in the process of, of finding some of these really exciting things. So here's you know, a couple of examples of some of the new species of fishes that we found. And um, the one up on the top here is a family of fishes that was only known, had only been observed um, by submersibles in, in very deep water and had never been collected by um, free swimming divers before. And here was this amazing new species that, that we found in the Verde Island Passage. And here's some of the other species of uh, fishes that were discovered on that um, 2014 expedition. There are also mesophotic nudibranchs, <clears throat> which are incredibly interesting. And there are a few, like the top three shown there, that are species that are found in shallow water but extend to um, at least below 100 meters depth. And so that was pretty cool. And the other thing was that there were lots of new species that were restricted to the, to the mesophotic. And um, one of the things that we found is that a lot of them were in this genus Halgerda, and um, that there really seemed to be a lot of meso different mesophotic species in Halgerda. And we know that there are a lot of species in this genus that are found in shallow water but we were really surprised to find a diversity um, of deep water species as well. But what was most surprising to me was that when we looked at their, um, their evolutionary relationships, 
all of the mesophotic species were close relatives of each other. Um, and that was suggesting that, that a single shallow water invader um, made it to the deeper water and then underwent speciation in deep water. And so if you look at the nudibranchs over here on the left-hand side, you can see that this one group is the group that invaded the mesophotic and then diversified there. In contrast, if we look at damselfishes that are found in the mesophotic, each one of the new species that we found in the Verde Island Passage had a different shallow water um, relative, which suggests a very different pattern of speciation, that basically um, shallow water species invaded the mesophotic region multiple times. And the reason we know that it's from shallow water to deep water is that if you look at the base of the tree, all of the um, most, um, the older species that are known in that group, both in the damselfishes and the nudibranchs, are found in sh shallow waters. And, and the more highly derived ones are the ones that have invaded the mesophotic. So this suggests that it went from shallow water to deep water. Well, I wanted to briefly talk about impacts of climate change on corals. Um, I was just on a, um, a Skype last night with colleagues in the Philippines who are talking about um, that there's new evidence of coral bleaching in uh, at least the western part of the Verde Island Passage, and we haven't received any reports from places like Puerto Galera and, and Anilao, but um, there is a lot of um, coral bleaching going on, at least in the weather, western part, and it would be really important to know what's going on in the central part of the Verde Island Passage. But um, these are long-term events. Um, we saw a major bleaching event um, that first started in places like Thailand, where major portions of, of coral reef were basically decimated and, and essentially died. Um, and these bleaching events um, you can see there are a few spots in the Philippines, um, but basically it was um, widespread in the Indomalay archipelago. Um, and when we looked at the Verde Island Passage, was, this was the first time that in 25 years of um, exploring the area that I had seen major coral bleaching. And if you look at these slide, top two um, photos from October, of 2010 and then we were able to go back in January and again in May looking at the same reef um, and basically by January there was already recovery of new zooxanthellae um, uh, and that the bleaching was disappearing and by May you couldn't even tell the difference and there was virtually no mortality in corals so this was really an interesting finding that the corals um, in the Verity Island Passage to see, seem to be far more resistant to coral bleaching and therefore probably to climate change in general. So one of the things that we've been doing in Atlantis has been incredibly helpful. Um, most of you will recognize Marco there in, at um, Atlantis. Um, in Dumaguete and um, basically we've been able to uh, do community outreach with um, uh, local municipal leaders, with kids um, to basically in many cases take kids into the water for the first time to see coral reefs and to put on a mask and snorkel and you know this is a way of opening up a new world to um, local people who depend on the coral reefs around them for their livelihoods, but only about 10 to 15% of people who live in coastal communities in the Philippines are able to swim, which is really surprising, including a lot of people who make their livelihood from fishing. And so um, interacting and connecting with local communities is really an important way of instilling 
uh, better protection and, and greater awareness about the importance of, of coral reefs. And when we've had our expeditions there, one of the things that we've always made a point of doing is making conservation recommendations to um, the local um, municipalities and, and jurisdictions uh, about what areas deserve special recognition and special protection. And we've been working on a project recently funded by the Oscar M. Lopez Center for Climate Change um, with colleagues at uh, De La Salle University in, in the Philippines to work with local communities um, to monitor their coral reefs and, and coastal ecosystems to develop strategies for better um, recognizing short-term changes that are happening that are going to be indicative of, of major climate change events. And one of the things that we've do, had it developed is basically ways of collecting rapid data about diversity of things like butterfly fishes, um, the numbers of blue linkia starfish, um, cor the, uh, the crown of thorns starfish, chocolate chip starfish, crinoids, and um, giant clams, as well as collecting data about coral diversity and density. Um, and the local community members are the people collecting the data and helping to analyze that data. And so implementing these rapid survey methods has really resulted in much greater awareness. It's created several new marine protected areas in different parts of the Garrity Island Passage, which has been something that has really been um, pushed by the local community members that want to um, conserve coral reefs and and protect them for ecotourism and the recognition that a long-term livelihood is really dependent on healthy reefs and, and the ability to attract visitors there to, to um, explore those reefs. And so this has been a really exciting um, conservation and community um, action um, activity that has really um, created a lot of awareness and a lot of positive change that we've seen in the attitudes and, and dedication of, of local community members who largely make their living by fishing and still do so, but are doing so in a much more um, uh, ecologically oriented, sustainable fashion. And so when we worry about the loss of coral reefs um, and the, the various options for the future, certainly the one on the right is the one we would all like to see. And the Verde Island Passage is one of those places where conservation has really taken hold. When I first started going there um, in 1992, there was dynamite fishing and cyanide fishing. And those practices have largely disappeared and are um, controlled and monitored by the local communities. And um, we've seen a real transformation. And so um, there are not many places in the world where you can say the coral reefs are healthier today than they were 25 years ago. And I think the Verde Island Passage is one of those places where we really can say that the efforts of education and working together with local communities have really paid dividends of having healthier reefs. And we need to keep doing this. We need to do this in more places around the world. And certainly in the Verde Island Passage where there, so much of marine diversity is really concentrated. And it matters because future generations really deserve the same opportunities that all of us have had to enjoy documenting marine biodiversity um, on a recreational basis, like most of us who photograph marine species and get great joy and pleasure from diving in these habitats, but more particularly to the local people whose really um, interdependence of, of survival 
um, is related, related directly to the health of those reefs and the resources that they provide for the coming generations. And so that's why it matters. Um, we couldn't do this work with all of the wonderful partners that we've had. And certainly Atlantis Resorts, I wanna give a big shout out to them because they've enabled our research to take place in both um, Puerto Galera and in Dumaguete and to really discover uh, a multitude of new scientific discoveries, but also enabled us to interact with local communities and create a brighter picture for the future of reefs. And I wanna thank you for tuning in and, and listening to some of the things that I had to say, and I will be delighted to answer your questions, but I know all of you are just itching like I am to get back into these wonderful, pristine, diverse waters and to work together to make sure they're there for future generations. So thank you so much. Hi, Terry. This is, this is Brent. I'm back. Um, really, really fantastic. Um, I think I'll speak for everybody in saying that, you know, I learned a whole lot there and I'm just um, inspired just one by learning about the biodiversity and also by just the fact that we've seen such a real life case study on the improvement, um, you know, getting the community involved in protecting their local resources to really create uh, a destination that, um, you know, provides scientific opportunities and then rec recreational opportunities for all of us to dive. Um, so yeah, let's let's jump into a few of the questions here. So we've had some some great ones, um, but to to jump right in, why do you feel there are different or unique species in the east part of the Verde Island Passage versus the west? Well, um, you know, I think the the main reason is that the different sides of the Verde Island Passage um, on on one side you have. On the west side, you have um, the West Philippine Sea, as people in the Philippines like to call it. In China, they like to call it the South China Sea for obvious reasons. Um, but there, the oceanographic conditions are very different than you find on the, in the East Philippine Sea. And the Verde Island Passage is the conduit that connects these two bodies of water together. And so, it's a very narrow strip that really provides the connection between areas that have otherwise been isolated for long periods of time. And um, we know that Mindoro um, and um, Palawan to the west of Mindoro um, have, are actually have very different um, geological origins. They are part of the the Asian subcontinent and we're always connected to Asia, whereas the rest of the Philippines basically came as islands that, that with plate tectonics moved up north in, into the, what we now know as the Philippines. And so a lot of these differences really reflect this separate evolutionary history of um, being connected and associated with the Asian subcontinent versus being um, new islands that have migrated over the last 20 million years up into the present configuration that we see in the Philippines. Wow, there's certainly, yeah, a lot at play there. Yes, um, there is. There is. Um, so here's a question from Arthur. Um, any changes with the seasons, summer, winter, spring, fall? So I, I guess, you know, general conditions for the area, and then also does that affect your research or the species you're finding, you know, depending on the time of year you are out there? Absolutely, and you know, one of the things that, that has been a myth about tropical regions of the world is that they don't have a huge amount of seasonality. But when you look at the Philippines, the, the different monsoon seasons, and then the summer season that um, is most popular for diving because the weather conditions are, are the best from about January to the end of May, which is called summer in the Philippines, um, is the optimal time when, 
when there are fewer storms and and so that is the time when you really see um, a lot of things undergoing reproduction and um, a lot of breeding going on. Um, and then during the two monsoon seasons with more wind and um, uh, typhoons and, and other storms that there's greater disruption, there's more fresh water into the, that is um, inputted into the, the system and so you do find different um, species present and different abundances and so if you're looking for marine biodiversity you definitely want to dive in the Philippines at, at different times of the year because you see different species and the other thing that we see is not only um, are there seasonal changes but from one year to another there can be greater nutrients that come up from the surface from the the upwelling that occurs in the Verde Island Passage and if there are more nutrients some years you'll find more algae sometimes you'll find less and so these different differences in um, different oceanographic conditions and and little triggers um, can create huge impacts in the terms of the different species that you observe there so over time we've seen tremendous changes that um, are contrary to um, the, the sort of traditional notion that the tropics are um, pretty much the same all the time and that they don't have a lot of changes that occur in them. And we've seen tremendous right. dynamics in that whole system. Very cool, okay. Um, this is a question from, from Donna, um, who visited Dumaguete in April, May of 2017. Um, is Porta Galera in the Verde Island Passage better for nudibranchs or Dumaguete? Um, and compared to Anilau, where would you go for nudibranchs? <laughs> I'd go everywhere. <laughs> no, uh, and I mean that not facetiously, but basically um, that you find different things in different places. and. Um, you know, Anilau um, to me was the place that I knew best before I really had time to explore um, uh, Puerto Galera. So the, you know, the Verde Island Passage has a greater concentration of species than you find in in places like Dumaguete, but you find unique things and unique habitats, and um, there are things that we found in Dumaguete that we've never seen in um in Anilao or Puerto Galera. And so every place we go, we find different um different um associations of different species and and um slightly different conditions um produce all these unique species and different opportunities for their interaction. And so um to really get a comprehensive picture you can't just focus on one area if you're really trying to understand biodiversity. That makes makes total sense. Um, okay, and it's a going, good excuse to go diving in lots of different places too. <laughs> I think sign all of us up. <laughs> We'd love to go. Um, well, with with that in mind, I'm going to skip a few questions. I'll come right back to those. But do you have volunteer opportunities to help with your work in research in the Philippines? Um, well, one of the things that uh, the the an the short answer is yes, but the the it's complicated by the fact that um, we have to, as a research institution, we have to dive under um, diving regulations that that um, someone has to be a certified scientific diver under the AAUS system, or they have to be checked out and go through a scientific diving certification process um, to ensure safety. And so um, the, the regulations are, are fairly rigorous and, um, you know, we have to have um, compliance checks of, of gear, um, of um, dive physicals, of insurance, of, 
And so um, the, if, if you want to do volunteer opportunities, if you can become associated with a local university in the US or um, under the AAUS system, that then there's reciprocity between all of the research institutions um, that have that. And so that's the easiest way to make that happen. Otherwise, um, you need to have one of our dive safety officers uh, do um, field certifications, which we've done, um, but we need to then have a dive safety officer from our institution there at all times. So I would say that's the greatest prohibition of of um, involving people. But, you know, there are lots of things all of you can do as citizen scientists and recording things. And so many of the new species that we've documented have been found by um, underwater photographers and people who are just really enthusiasts of, of documenting new marine life that looks unusual to them. Oftentimes these are new species. Perfect. What would you suggest for the, the photographers and divers, video shooters, if they do find something that they feel is truly unique and not in the guidebooks, maybe hasn't been identified? Well, um, there are several um, uh, web platforms where you can post photos of um, that um, groups of experts are happy to identify and tell you if it's something new. The Academy um, is involved with um, a, a web platform um, called iNaturalist, um, just the letter I, naturalist. And people can post photos um, and that have documented locality information. And then um, a community of, of experts and, and um, people who are not professional biologists who have expertise and a lot of knowledge about fishes and other marine life um, will um, crowdsource identifications and, and you will get a lot of feedback very quickly um, if you post something that's new or unusual. And I'd recommend that as a, a, a vehicle for doing it. And the other thing that's really cool about iNaturalist is that it's searchable. So you can search where other people have um, uh, found different species and, and it will also give you some pretty good clues of good places to look for unusual things that you're interested in, in photographing or documenting. So it has mutual benefit. Okay, very interesting. And that's a, a great tip for those out to, to find something specific. Um, so here's a question from, from Roger. Do you think that the Verde Island Passage is more resistant to the negative effects of climate change than other reef systems? And if so, why? Um, it definitely is resistant, at least in the, um, the short term. I think that there's a variety of things going on. I think that um, in the first place, um, for those of you who have been diving in the Verde Island Passage, it's got a lot of deep water, it's got strong currents, and so there's a lot of mixing. Um, and so that um, upwelling and mixing of water uh, doesn't allow the temperature to increase as greatly as other parts of the Philippines that have shallow water um, that doesn't drop off into deeper, cooler water very quickly or doesn't have as strong currents that that allow that mixing to take place. So um, the other thing is that um, we feel that that the corals that have evolved in the Verde Island Passage are are much more resistant to coral bleaching, and the the symbiotic algae found in those corals are also resistant to elevated water temperatures. And so all of those factors bode um, very well for the Verde Island Passage. But I think the other thing I wanted to add is that because it is, you know, not only the greatest concentration of diversity, but the, this area of resilience, that it really means that we need to protect the Verde Island Passage because it can serve as 
a repository that can replenish other areas that don't have all of those advantages of diversity and resilience. That's really, really good point. It actually reminds me um, of something called the Champion Tree Project um, happening topside. Um, <laughs> we'll try and stay yeah. focused here, um, but fantastic. Um, so here's a question from, from Russell. Um, since the species accumulation curve for all places compared have not yet flattened, if we continue sampling in all of those places in comparison with the Verde Island Passage, do you think it's possible that the species richness will then be comparable? Well, um, that, it's certainly possible, but based on the, the steepness, the differences in the steepness of the curves, um, it suggests that they are going to plateau um, sooner and thus have fewer overall species than, than um, those that have steeper rises in that diversity. And if we're using the same sampling methodology and the same number of dives um, that are used to come up with those curves, then I think we're on pretty safe ground that the ones that have steeper rises are, are ultimately going to have more species present. But what we do know is that the more we look, the more we find. And so um, it's not outside the realm of possibility that some of these other areas will have just as much richness. Okay. Um, in the, the Verde Island Passage, this is a question from Ronnie. Do you see different growth rate in the corals there versus other areas, areas of the Philippines? Um, I think one of the things that we have seen um, is that, uh, you know, there's a really good example in, um, on um, Maracaban Island, just sort of northwest of, of Puerto Galera. Um, which is where a lot of people who go to Anilao dive out at, at, um, in Tingloy um, on Maracaban Island. And um, we know of an area that was really very um, seriously decimated by overfishing, dynamiting. I dove on there like 15, 20 years ago, and it was a really sad, place in terms of um, very low fish diversity, very few live corals. And um, a local woman um, basically led her community to protect that reef and to basically to cause a, to create a ban of diving and fishing on it for six years. And we um, were the first people that got to dive on that reef after the six years. And after six years, there were already lots of young corals, there were lots of juvenile fish. And now, even five years later, after that six years, it is a flourishing reef that, that you know, you wouldn't even know that it had been so dramatically decimated. So, um, we don't see as rapid recovery um, in other places that it usually takes about 30 years um, for a reef to replenish itself. But in the Verde Island Passage, we know um, from a lot of case history that, that decimated reefs can recover within a decade. Wow. It's a huge, huge difference when you look at it that way. Yeah. Um, so a question from Jem, what were some of the challenges and problems you've encountered in your research in the Philippines? And how do you think we should re respond to such, uh, such problems with, with biodiversity? I guess um, any problems with the research and conducting the research that you've had there um, or anything you've overcome? Well, you know, I've... I feel really lucky that we have not had many problems. We've had <clears throat> great support from local communities, from the dive community, um, from local governments, from the national government that, uh, that provides 
the permits that allows our research to take place. Um, we've had tremendous cooperation and and I think one of the really encouraging things to me is that when you talk to people in the Philippines and it, and I'm talking about you know people who live in fishing communities and in coastal areas and you talk to them about climate change it's not like talking to people who say oh climate change is a hoax that you know there's no resistance to it because people whose lives depend on it have seen it daily um, and the impacts and and there's I would say a greater awareness in the Philippines than there are is in a lot of um, different parts of the world and and people are so appreciative of the work that we do there and the partners that we have and um, that you know, I, there's just been tremendous um, receptivity. And so I think part of that is that we've been very lucky and fortunate, but another part of that is that we've tried to be good partners and that we don't just go in there, take a bunch of goodies and leave, that we train people, that we um, have brought students from the Philippines to San Francisco to get um, master's degrees and, and advanced degrees and um, that we've tried to be really good partners so that everybody benefits from the relationship and all of the information that we collect, we share with everybody. And I mean, uh, other academic institutions, but also with local communities about what we've seen, why it might be important to them, and what it, its implications might be to um, better conservation practices. So I think all of that works together in a very cooperative spirit. And hopefully that will persist. Okay, fantastic. And one last very quick question here to sum this all up in one sentence. What is the reason, in your opinion, that the Verde Island Passage is so unique and so special? Well, I think, you know, diversity is everything. Um, that diversity is all founded on the fact that you have suitable habitat, that you have had geological processes over time, that, and you have oceanographic conditions that um, you know, with deep water and strong currents that have all contributed to that tremendous diversity and and the resilience that we see. And that's what makes it, you know, probably one of the most important marine areas in the entire world. And um, it's it's really, you know, a place that I care deeply about, obviously, and one that I'm tremendously optimistic will be there for all of us to enjoy for a long time to come. Absolutely. Um, and all of us um, at Atlantis feel the same and, and think the same. So, you know, thank you so much from, from all of us um, who are here on the webinar, listening, watching. We're getting some great comments popping through saying thank you, learning a lot, excellent presentation. So we really appreciate you taking the time and, you know, giving us this information and sharing with us. And we, we all hope to see you in the water soon. Let's stay safe and be diving soon. Take care, everybody. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Terry. And for everyone, we will have this webinar on demand on our website, atlantishotel.com slash Philippines dash webinars. So if you have friends who did not see it, they can check that out there. Um, I'll put a link in the chat in just a second. Um, but we also have a number of webinars coming up. So visit that same page and you'll see all of our upcoming webinars. Again, thank you to talk, Dr. Terry Gosliner and we'll talk soon. Great, thank you so much.